Welcome back to the Physique Development Podcast. Today is a listener's favorite where Sue and I get to sit down and hang out and talk about a bunch of different topics, like who would be our celebrity guest on the podcast, what in the world is going on in the NFL right now, and what is our least favorite holiday with some really hot takes. Make sure that you subscribe to the channel, leave us a like, and we'll see you on the inside. Alex, now that you've been a part of two different 5Ks, how are you feeling? Tell me tell me about your 5K this past weekend. So the first 5K, there was maybe 100 participants. It was very low-key. We showed up, we got our bibs and stretched and ran. And then this weekend's 5K was a massive event. Um, <laughs> it, they had on their advertising that there was 10,000 plus participants. And I was like, oh, 10,000. <laughs> It is the middle of November in Columbus, Ohio. You're not going to have 10,000 people running just a general 5, 10, and 15K. To my immense surprise, uh, prior to driving there, I had gambled a million dollars to Sue and Miguel that there is no way on God's green earth there's 10,000 people. And we got there. Um copious amounts of traffic. Couldn't even get near the location in which we were running because everything was barricaded off. Police everywhere. <laughs> there are people everywhere. There are people, there's an intercom that's somehow all over the entire downtown of Columbus <laughs> that can be You're heard so far. Exactly for blocks. And I was, um, I was flabbergasted <laughs> at the amount of people. It was so overstimulating and I had no idea. Backtrack even further there were directions in this email that I completely disregarded because of my last 5K experience. One of those being getting your bib and all things the day prior. I saw that in the last 5K we did, said that, and I said, you know what? <laughs> I got my bib at the very beginning last time. I'm just gonna do that again. Well, with this easily 10,000 people. <laughs> easily. Getting to the start of the 5K was a, a hurdle. Um, we were we parked probably a mile away mm -hmm. from where we were starting the run. And on that intercom that I said you could hear for blocks, they had said that there were going to be no late starters. And I immediately, as soon as I heard that over the intercom, I said, I am up far too early because this rust this run started at 7 a.m. I'm up far too early. And I don't, I didn't even really want to do this. I am not getting all the way over there and them telling me I can't start because I was late. And so I don't even say anything to Sue and Miguel and I just Takes start off. running. <laughs> just take, we're just all walking. And I'm like, well, Alex is gone now. He's somewhere up there. So I start running and it's a decent bit until we get to the front of the race. Mm -hmm. I have no bib. I have not registered. I, I've paid for the race, but I have not registered. Um, and there are multiple people as I'm running as fast as I can to the starting line. Not warmed up at all. Not warmed up. That and was my warm weather. up. It's freezing. It's <laughs> 30 degrees outside. Yeah. Um, I'm running there. I have maybe two or three people that try to stop me and say, I can't run without a bib. And I do not, I act like I'm deaf. <laughs> I do not even acknowledge these people. I have my, fa I'm facing forward and I'm not even, my eyes are not changing. <laughs> I'm running straight to the front of this line with probably a group that was far faster than me. They have everything fenced off. I decide that I'm going to hop the fence and just get in line. I kick some dude as I'm getting over the fence, apologize. And then I probably stand in that position for 15 minutes. <laughs> No late starts. <laughs> it, we started it very late. Yes. Um, the first group went off later than the start time that they said. Oh, yeah. Easily. But they were not only that that was the start time on everything that you registered, but also over this intercom saying no late starts, no late starts. I hear the late, the first start go off like 10, 10, 15 minutes after the allotted time. Yeah. And, but what really cued it to me is that he was saying no late starts and I'm seeing 100, 200 people easily. still easily, I mean, five, 10 minutes away from the start line. And so then at that point, I decide not to be worried because really they have to do that many people in different heats. So I'm thinking I'm walking it. I did not run it. I will just calm down. And so I went to the bathroom 
I waited in a very long line at a porta potty. And then I find where the bibs are. And I also find Miguel. And we're both like, do, do you know where Alex is at? No idea. Neither of us have any earthly idea. And Miguel says he basically got manhandled trying to get into the race because he did not have a bib on. And so he had to come back, get in line. And, you know, you could pick up the bibs the day of. They just don't want you to. And we're waiting in line. And Alex is like, I'm at this group. And we're like, how did he get there? How did he get his bib so quickly? Why didn't he get bibs for us? What is going on? And so we text him. We're like, where's your bib? Where'd you get it? I don't have a bib. <laughs> and then we hear it start. We're waiting in line. We get our bibs. And then Miguel's like, all right, I'm just, I guess I'm going to get in the run and we're going to go from there. And I wait for my sister and our friend Kayla to come. And we scoot back because there was, you had to go all the way to the back if you're going to walk it. And so soon after we started the race, because we had to be in such a late corral, we get a text from Alex being like, I finished the race. So it was quite the experience. Further important context is that I thought I was going to be able to go to yoga at 1030. <laughs> I thought that because the race was at seven and then um, I knew that it was only a 5K, so it was going to be max. We we're going to be there for 45 minutes or well, and Miguel was running the 10. So I guess we would have been there for an hour, but that still puts us at like getting home at the latest of nine o'clock. So I'm thinking I'm going to go to yoga at 1030. Um, it does not dawn on me until I finish the race and start to walk. I, I go to the porta potty and I realize that Sue and all of them just started and they're going to be every bit of an hour to walk it. And I'm like, oh my, I'm going to be standing in, in the cold for the next hour waiting. And then we're going to have to, you know, find them and then get back to the car. So that's going to be probably another hour. So I was like, I have two hours freezing now. So I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, an interesting experience. I ran faster this go around. My uh, last 5K was 24 minutes and 59 seconds. And then this one was 24 minutes and 24 seconds. So a step up. I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the race time, but it was uh, my watch time. So, you know, take that for whatever it is. <laughs> Which as you finish the race, everyone got a picture and each of your bibs had like a tracker in it to be able to know your time and to get you your pictures. And so we all got our pictures across the finish line and Alex was like, well, where's mine? I need to know where mine's at. So then we scour through thousands and thousands of photos, but we found them. Mm -hmm. And you know, you got one of you looking really intense going after it. Because I am intense. You are intense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on weather? Weather. <laughs> yes. I thought that we could take some time, talk about the best weather, the worst weather, and then maybe even take it into holidays to really hear your take on that. So my favorite weather just in general, or yeah. is it location? Rank, rank the weather. <laughs> like the seasons? Uh, not necessarily the seasons, just like types of weather. <laughs> Okay. I like it to be sunny with pretty minimal clouds. That's probably my favorite, like 70 degrees. Okay. That's number one. Um, number two would be a little bit colder than that <laughs> <laughs> with similar sunlight. <laughs> I would just like to have maximal sunlight every day. I despise, especially here in the Midwest, of how dreary it gets. And it's been two straight days now of it being basically pitch black all day. And so the the sunlight that we're getting is very, very minimal. So last place will be the weather that we're experiencing right now of very rainy, cold, and no sunlight. But I will take rainy and cold with no sunlight if I'm just hanging out. Mm -hmm. But we got a job to do. <laughs> We've got things to get done on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is not the setting that I like to be in when that's the case. And so if it's just like a, a Saturday or a Sunday and I have been nothing on the docket and we can just curl up and watch movies, awesome. But that doesn't off happen often. <laughs> Would you say that rain is worse than snow? Depends on what type of snow. Like the Midwest people understand that if it's ice with snow, worst. Like it cannot, that cannot be beat of terrible situations because you can't really drive. And then it's just, and then trying to shovel it off your driveway is a nightmare. Um, so that is the worst, but I would take like powdery snow, probably over rain. I think that when it comes to that slush 
snow yeah. too, that's pretty miserable. Because I think when it comes to weather, the biggest determinant, of course, I love the sun, but a huge determinant is how dirty do the dogs get? Yeah. Because when it comes to snow, normally it's like their bellies and their legs slash feet that I'm cleaning off. But when it comes to rain, it's their whole freaking body. And so I get really deterred from rain because it's just like, oh, that's going to be miserable with the dogs. Right. I mean, all weather I, it, with the dogs, I say sunny, 70, no possible issues with them because I just despise cleaning them off. Yes. What would you say is your least favorite holiday or what's a stupid holiday? A stupid holiday? Um my least favorite holiday. What are can we can we specify what holidays are? Well, like I'm not thinking like President's Day, Fourth of July. I that counts as a holiday. Valentine's Day. I mean, it's a Hallmark holiday, but yeah. Um. So like Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, or New Year's, whatever you want to call it. Let's put Valentine's, St. Patrick's Day. And 4th of July. Would that be the main ones? I can't believe that St. Patrick's Day found their way into the top well, six. Well, as far, I'm thinking of, yes, like, for example, you have, like, President's Day or something like that off of work for corporate America. But truthfully, if you're thinking about things that you would do something for, I feel like those are the main ones. Mm -hmm. My least favorite holiday would be the 4th of July. And that may be a hot take. Um, and it's not because of what is being celebrated. <laughs> It's more There's so America. how things are being celebrated. I think that uh, fireworks are a waste of money, and I think that fireworks are annoying, and I don't really understand the hype around them. I think as we have children, that may be become cooler. Like they may really enjoy it. I've just never enjoyed them all that much. So that would go down as my least favorite holiday. What about you? Did I say Halloween in there? Oh, Hall no, Halloween's still higher for me than 4th really? of July. Yeah. Well, I think like I at least, well, I like Halloween because it's around my birthday, but I really like the creativity people have around Halloween. Now, when I walk around our neighborhood and people have certain decorations out, I feel like I can learn a lot about certain types of people. So what's your issue with uh, decorations? Tell me more about what's your qualm. I think you know what I'm talking about. I do, but I think the listeners don't. I don't really want to largely offend someone, but there are just some types of decorations that I'm all for Christmas lights. I am all for, you know, changing the wreath on your door, adding some stuff to your front porch, even making it fun. I, I've seen some well done Halloween decorations, but the first spiders hanging off of trees, that's a no for me because I'm walking in the dark. And I saw one of those <laughs> on the, the ground. Are real. Well, I saw one on the ground on our walk the other day, and the way it was on the ground frightened me. We don't need any of that. Then I'm sorry, I really don't get most of the time. I think I've seen one or two well done. I don't get the webs coming down from like the top of the house into the yard. I just don't, I don't love that. And then, like, the blow-ups. Uh, I, thought, I thought you were going to say the inflatables yeah, was number inflatables. one. Yeah, inflatables. The inflatables, I, just, I, I don't get. I, I don't get it. And it's like, it doesn't need to be decorated for Halloween. If you want to, I guess. Yeah. It, it's just uh, exterior decorations for holidays are tough. Yeah. More is less, basically. And less is less more. Is, less is more. Yeah, that's it. Um, <laughs> but more is less at yeah. the same time. Less good. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I would say I'm, I like Christmas lights. Well done Christmas lights um, is, is nice. But then the inflatables are my big yeah. one that I'm like, it's probably Inflatables not even yeah. during Christmas because there's that one house. That has all those huge inflatables. Like, I wonder how many people size. in our neighborhood listen to our podcast. No one. No, not no one. I'm sure there's. Katie does. Hi, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> there are people in the in the in the neighborhood that listen to the pod. Well, the person I'm talking about with the inflatables isn't in the neighborhood, but it's near the neighborhood, and that's the life size. They're like taller than the house on that corner. Sure. Those are too too much. Hey, to each their own, I suppose. I guess. I guess it's not harming me, but I still internally don't love it. Yeah. So I agree, 4th of July, not a favorite up there. St. Patrick's Day, like I'm not really wanting to do anything for it. So I guess if I think about the holidays I would want to do something for, it would really just be my birthday, 
Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> the bir- Your birthday is a national holiday? I just put it in there. I think it's a national holiday from a month perspective, all of October. Mm-hmm. You know, we just, Sue Bush's Sue birthday. Sue Bush. Sue My birthday is in a couple of days. By the time you guys listen to this, I'll already have turned 29 years old. You had to think about that for a second? I did have to think about that for a second. How are you feeling? Going to be 29 years old. I'm feeling 29. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, how am I feeling? Um, I feel the same. I feel very exhausted from life at the moment, but it has nothing to do with my age inherently. So that's how I feel. What are you most excited about with what 29 brings? I I am very excited to put a bow on this year and uh, (laughs) just get into 2024 because it's going to feel like a very strong, clean slate. Um, I am excited to just continue to lean more into myself. This is 28 was a year in which I have spent a lot of time just being more of myself and, and not a, like not lessening myself for others, um, which has put me in conversations that I don't love and, and con- like confrontation that I don't love and so on and so forth. But it's been such a year of growth for me that I've, I've learned a lot of, of lessons in ways that I probably would not have chose to learn those particular lessons, but um, such is life. And it's a, a year that I'll be able to look back on as a very difficult year. Um, but a year that was necessary for me to get where I wanted to be. I'm a very strong believer that I'm a strong believer in equal and opposite reactions. And with how this year has been for me, I am, or for us, for us, um, I am so set for a catapult into something so special. And I just want to ensure that I am ready for whatever that brings into my life and and being in a place where I am welcoming that and not being shut off in a way that I'm angry or bitter with all the adversity that was dealt my way. Um, And so heading into the year, that's my, my mindset. What does it look like to be ready for those good things that are gonna happen? I think that, how I go about it would be more mindset related, how I'm, how I'm talking about myself, how I'm talking to myself, how I, my perspective of, of how things are, are transpiring, because I think that it's very easy in a, an angrier or bitter mindset to think that life is, is happening to you rather than happening for you. And, um, being in a place of abundance and and really forcing myself to to believe that there is good on the horizon even if you know things have been crappy and I've had really hard days I just continue to reiterate to myself that the good is is coming and I just need to stay on my path because I do feel I do feel a strong understanding that I'm doing the right things. It's not that I am veering off of my path of what I'm meant to be doing or the things that are most important to me. I'm still prioritizing the things that I know are best in my life. Um, it's just that at this moment, things are not panning out how I would have envisioned them to, or if I was the one writing the story, how they would have happened. Um and as much as I would love to sit here, being someone who loves to be in control of all things possible, there's just things that I don't have control over. But the things that I do have control over, I feel like I'm doing everything in my power to do what's best. And so I would say doing those things is the best way to be in a, a place to receive and, and being in a mindset of overall abundance as a whole. If you're listening to this, then that means our 12-week GLUT program is now available on our website, and it is discounted for a very limited amount of time for Black Friday. So you can head to the link below in the description box or the show notes to be able to access this. I am so jazzed for you guys to get into this. As you guys know, or maybe you don't know, I have been running this program and have seen incredible results, even ones that people have called fake, which makes me so proud. And yes, I'm going to keep clinging to that. But go ahead and check it out. And I'm excited to see your gains too. I think mindset is a gigantic component of that. But I also think that you're setting yourself up with some of the things that you're just putting in place and 
really actively working towards of you know that you might need a little bit more help or support in some different areas. You're getting that set up. So if a big opportunity or if something comes into place, you have everything else in line to be able to do that. Because I think that sometimes people think, okay, if I just believe it's going to happen. And I know that's not what you're saying. But I even used to think that of, okay, when people talk about manifestation or when people talk about this, you just have to dream really big and believe it's going to happen. But you also actively have to work towards that and do the things that someone in the position you want to be in is doing. And I think that's the whole epitome of fake it till you make it is not necessarily of just absolutely fake what you're doing, but fake that you're Fake that you're taking the steps or that you are convincing yourself. That's how you fake it is just being like, oh, I can convince myself. I can get past these doubts inside my own head and I can say that I'm going to do this. Because even for something like podcasting or being on YouTube, there were so many doubts in my head and it's like I had to get past those doubts and kind of fake it to myself of being like, you can do this and you can take those steps, but it's also doing those things to set yourself up. I don't know if it's so much that you are are faking it. I think that it's more of an understanding that everything is reps Yeah, and you've just got to put the reps in to get to the place that you want to be. And using the reference of the podcast, like this is episode 140 something. And a lot of the podcasts that we consume and I, I, I watch how people interview or I, I, I watch how people convey um, a, a point that they're making or what have you. A lot of those people are 400 plus episodes in, if not a thousand plus episodes in, and they may have multiple podcasts that they're a part of. And I can, and, and I can get into this mindset of comparison of like, oh my gosh. Like they're so much better than me. I, I'd like, but I also realize the amount of repetitions that they have had is significantly more. And I, I believe that if if I'm able to um, consume that person's uh, data or, or or their content and make my way to that 400th episode or that 500th episode, I can be better than them because I have them as a reference point now at 140 episodes and I can continue to grow and and use them as that reference until I get to 400. And so just understanding that it's, it, it, it's just a matter of continuing to chip away relative to what's wrong with me is a really important tidbit. I I can agree with that for sure, because even applying it to my own life of thinking about the role that I've taken on as CEO, it's that it's not that I've had to fake it till I get to this point. It's just every day I'm learning something new about what it means to be in this position. And every day I'm trying to apply, take that information and take the step that makes the most sense for the information that I have. And so it's very human to look at that and think, oh, I just can't do it. When it's like, oh, no, you're doing it, but you can do it better and you can improve on that as you build. What do you, do you feel like now, now that you've been in this role for, how long would you say you've been in this particular role? Um, About a year. Which is crazy. Yeah. But in terms of decisions, like if we were to go the opposite route and flip, it would, it just would not work this way. You yeah. know, like if we would have made the decision of Alex as the CEO, which at the time we wouldn't have, have made yeah. um, because- just our strengths in general, it made way more sense, even though it was difficult for you to make that transition. It was much better of an option for you to get into that role. And you have been able to flourish so much since getting into it and excel so greatly and build a team that is exactly the culture that we want to have. And we've worked so hard to to create and you've been the catalyst in that. Um, and, and I know that I give you a ton of praise. And one thing that we always say to one another is that somebody else has to say it <laughs> for us to really appreciate the value in what's being said or the compliment that's being said, because you are my wife and and you should be, you know, hyping me up type situation. Um, but I, I think that you've done such a, an amazing job transitioning into this. And, and it's something where there's been so many things that have come up in which you've been scared or don't have the answers to and have 
bucked up and and found a way to get the answers and and uh, sought out resources and all those different things. And um, you're just going to continue to be so strong in this role because this is what you're meant to do. Well, thank you. I I feel a lot better than I did about it a year ago or six months ago. And hopefully in another six months, I feel even better than I do now. Um, it's just been a process for sure and a, a lot of learning along the way, a lot of just trying to make decisions and seeing if they were the right ones. Uh, but talking about the podcast and you listening and or watching so many podcasts, if you were going to be on someone's podcast, mm. a guest on someone's podcast right now, what would be the person's podcast that you want to be on? So I think that Tim Ferriss is probably the best interviewer on the planet. I think he is immaculate in being able to ask questions and um, be able to curate conversation. And rightfully so. He's He is on the Mount Rushmore of, of podcasters because he was one of the first. Um, and he's continued to, to flourish in doing so. Um, so I'd love to be interviewed by Tim Ferriss. I'd love to create a large enough impact to where that opportunity presents itself. Um, I would love to be on the Joe Rogan podcast. I think that would be a really cool experience. Two, two goats in the space, but two completely different types of conversation that would be curated. Um, and so I would love the the challenges and and the the differences between the two. That would be that would be there. I think that um, being on the Modern Wisdom podcast, that would be another one where I think Chris does an amazing job with asking questions. Are you guys getting a theme here? <laughs> I really like the the thought provoking questions. I, I'm much more about getting into the depths of conversation relative to the surface level of like, how are you? Where are you from? Tell me about, you know, you. about yourself. Like really get into the the details of, of what For that person- For those who don't know, can you introduce yourself? Right. <laughs> like I, I don't love that. And so I think that the Modern Wisdom podcast would be another one I would really appreciate an opportunity. Um, and then I would like to interview, I don't know if, if me being interviewed by Alex Hermosi would be the answer or it'd be me interviewing Alex because I think that I would like to interview Alex. I would do so much- Research. Re I mean, so much. I've already done so much research yeah. organically. You would take like a week off to prepare for it, literally, and to get everything ready. I, I would love to 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 be able to interview him and and have questions that really had him dig deep to think of answers, like it, because he's he's one very very smart and and uh, so talented in the space that he's found himself in, um, or, or worked his way into. And uh, I think that would be so cool. So those those four, I think, would be huge. And then my my fun one, my fun one would be to be on Two Bears <laughs> and be interviewed by Tom Segura. I think that would I would sit there for days. I, I was thinking that was going to be your first one. It is. It, it, well, so of the ones that I consume the most consistently, Two Bears is probably number one. Uh, the Modern Wisdom podcast is another one. Tim Ferriss. I don't know. All four of those. I, <laughs> I was about to say, you listen all to four all of those. Four. I listen to a decent bit, um, but I would love to be on Two Bears. I mean, Tom Segura is my my favorite comedian. He is, uh, I think, in terms of humor and things that like how he thinks and those different things, I just feel in, in strong alignment with a lot of it, um, which may rub some people wrong. I don't know. But the uh, that would be yeah you know, top four or five whatever that was. I would love to be on two bears, but I would love if both of us could be on YMH. Yeah, if we could both be on YMH, that, that would, would be, be awesome. awesome. <laughs> that would be so awesome. I know we would die. I know I, I would, would be just so happy away. the entire time. Mm -hmm. I would have so many questions, and and it would be so easy because we've just consumed so many of their podcasts, and then also kill Tony. <laughs> Yeah, being on Kill Tony would be awesome. Yeah. I have no idea what I would do. Um, and for those who are not familiar with Kill Tony, it is a live podcast, live podcast that is a uh, stand-up comedian or like stand-up comedy, mm -hmm. and they pull names out of a bucket and they have 60 seconds to come up. They're just hoping that their name gets pulled. There's thousands of people that apply every single Monday. And uh, they're hoping for that 60 seconds. They get up there. Some people bomb. Some people crush. And the people that crush honestly create a career a for themselves career. Oh, that yeah. catapults them into stardom. It's amazing. And it's so cool that um, Tony Hinchcliffe, who's created this, has created the opportunity for all these women and men to get up there and potentially 
take their, you know, change their life for forever. Um, but it also could go the opposite direction and then they, they can bomb and he is an amazing roaster. So good. So you're, you're going to hear it if you suck. So it's, it's funny because growing up and we've talked about this a number of times, but when it comes to trash talk and or roasting, of course, when it comes to like siblings, I I've, I've roasted my siblings before I roast you every once in a while, but I had never really done like trash talk and being able to watch like for Kill Tony of how they interact and have the roasting and the trash talk plus our fantasy football league uh, group chat has really allowed me to see Strengthened. the other side of it. I, I used to not understand it at all, but now I get it a little bit more for sure. Individuals who are able to not get their feelings hurt with trash talk are some of my favorite people. Yeah. Like people that are able to banter and not get too emotional with comments that are made and, and uh, jokes that are made are my type of people. On Bachelor in Paradise, I know you care so much, but they did a roast for the last episode. Yeah. And people got their feelings so hurt. Like in the not like at the island. But, yeah. Oh, is that no, the island? at the island? They they're like, where we normally do the rose ceremony, we're going to do a roast ceremony. Interesting. And they had people like pair off into groups of two and like write the jokes and then roast other people. And there were like two or three girls who really got the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. And I get it definitely was rude. And a lot of it was rooted in truth. Like they weren't incredible roasters or joke makers as a whole. But I, I would hate to be like roasted if it was just me being roasted, but if it's, you know, a back and forth, I can do that. I'm good with that. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't hold an event as a yeah, roast like for me. A roast me. Yeah. Like a Michael Scott roast. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Roasted. <laughs> I was also going to ask who you would like to have on the podcast oh. or who you would like to interview. So you already said Alex Hermosi. Who else makes the list? Tom Segura. <laughs> I would love to have him on here. I would love to ask him questions. I would uh, I would really enjoy that. Aaron Rodgers. Oh, <laughs> don't even get me started. I wouldn't even – I would take the week off to prepare my questions. Pat McAfee. Yep. I mean, all Ty of our Schmidt. friends. <laughs> <laughs> I will say with Ty, it really frustrates me that his desk has no Packer stuff really shining through. I think that he needs to show that fandom just a little bit more on his desk. Those would be the the handful off of the bat. And it's funny. Probably, AJ Hawk? AJ Hawk's in there probably. <laughs> um, it's funny because people listening are probably thinking I'm going to say like a bunch of fitness individuals. Um, I would like to have Chris Bumstead on. That mm -hmm. would be a cool experience to have a, a chat with him and uh, learn more about him. And, and uh, I think that I would like to discuss more mental health aspects, especially with um, him and Courtney just announcing that they're um, – they're pregnant, which is amazing. So awesome for them. And, you know, talking about the the mental health components of, of him um, getting into fatherhood sooner rather than later and how that's kind of affected him. I would love to have that kind of conversation. But who would you like to have on the podcast? Well, first, you're a they are pregnant type of person. I mean. Are you carrying a child? She's pregnant. They're having a child. It takes two to tango. <laughs> I know that he's not going to deliver the baby or carry the baby, but he has a very intricate part throughout the pregnancy once the baby is delivered. Oh and as he is a father, he has a very, very important job. It is not as great as the job of the the mom, but it is still a very high priority and a very I'm integral part. giving you grief. So I would say that they are pregnant, yes. <laughs> As far as who I would like to have on the podcast, I mean, Deion Sanders still. Oh, Deion would be great. I mean, if he is listening to any of the calls I've, you know, put out there into the universe, I would love to talk to you because you are my idol. You can help design my tattoo for you in honor of you when you're on the podcast. We can go through some ideas and I'll get yatted. You'll see it. I'll make it happen. Uh, so... That would be one of the the top people for me. Just one person. Well, you you said a lot of the other people I would want. So you no know other people. What about some of the makeup channels that you watch on YouTube? Would you say that you would want to interview any of them? No, I would like to do like a YouTube video with them. Like if we were to do of they picked out makeup and then I picked out makeup and they had to do a full face with like my makeup and then we talk about the makeup then that would be fun. That would be cool. Yeah. I'm sure that one that the listeners would like to have and the one that we've talked about time and time again is having Hayden and Katie on. 
I think so. And I in think in time this will happen. This will happen in time. We've we've talked about it probably a hundred times, but in in probably the sooner rather than later future, it'll happen. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. And talking about friends, what would be your ideal friend weekend? Friend weekend, like going somewhere? What would be like your ideal thing to do if you're having like a friend weekend? Gosh, um... I don't know how I could have made it more clear. <laughs> I, I go back, you know, speaking of Katie and Hayden, when we went to Telluride was so much fun. Um, being able to go hiking and just getting to be in a location, a bigger Airbnb all together and getting to spend the mornings and the evenings together doing things throughout the day. I find that to be probably the, the best situation. I agree. We need, we need one of those situations. We soon. do. We do. What do you want people to know about you? What do I want people to know about or me? Or like, what do you wish someone knew about you or you could tell people about you or they could understand about you? I think that I buffered my humor a lot at the beginning of like being on the internet to not allow people to um, think that I was not as intelligent because I, I, I the two were separate to me and my my mind and what was being told to me from some of the individuals around me uh, was that with the humor, it comes off as being stupid. And so you need to stay very serious so that individuals perceive you as smart. And it's like, I can be funny and I can also be smart. They can coexist. And so um, I, I think that my, my humor, my sarcasm, those things, um, I, I think that one thing that my clients get a ton of is how much I care and and how much I put and, and invest into people. And, and I wish that I did a better job of maybe showing that. And maybe I do, but I just don't necessarily feel like I do. Um, so those would be the maybe two big rocks. I think that you definitely show that you care about people. I think people could see that if they consume anything that you do as a whole. I think that that is something that's obvious. I will agree with the, the humor part or just being goofy overall of wanting to come over uber serious, especially when you were younger in the space of thinking that, okay, because I'm younger and I'm goofy, then that's going into where my intelligence is being perceived by someone else. But I think that one thing that you wish people knew about you is that you're like when you're direct, you're just being direct and you're not being any which way. Cause yeah. I think that when That's people misunderstand that, it just adds so much frustration to your like, I just said exactly that. It didn't, you didn't have to read into it anymore. And I feel like that's something that you often kind of wish people could just understand of what you meant. Yeah. I think that the, the lack of desire for small talk from me mm -hmm. is perceived as I don't want to talk to someone or what have you. Whereas it really is you're seeking an answer in terms of the question that you asked me or what have you. And I give you that answer. And then to me, that's like, okay, on to the next thing, nothing, no strings attached, but more often people are like, maybe he didn't want to talk to me. It's like, no, no, I just want to get to something more meaningful than this surface level question that you asked or whatever. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like you need more of in your life right now? Oh, time. <laughs> what do I need more of in my, in my life right now? I think that oftentimes when we're looking for needing more of what we actually need is already just in front of us and we're looking beyond what's in front of us. Um, and so the thing that I probably need to employ the most is just more patience and continuing to be in a space where my time is is coming the the time for these projects or the time for the things that i'm investing into is coming and, and i don't need to be over evaluating every small move that i make of like was this the right one should we have should we have done things differently should i've done things differently should i've um x y and z like over evaluation and and sticking more so to to action and trusting in my intuition um because this is uh, with what we're doing, this has been my life for a decade, basically. And my intuition has guided me to some of the best decisions I've possibly made. I, I think about some of these things of, of especially like you and I 
getting married type mm -hmm. situation. That was all gut. You know, I went direct. <laughs> I mean, I listened to myself the whole way through <laughs> because I didn't, I didn't take anyone else's opinion into consideration. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went straight for exactly what I thought was best. And it, it was the best decision of my life. And with that being the case, I need to just trust in that more um, and, and not second guess where that's leading me. Speaking of us, what would you change, if anything, about our wedding? What would I change about our wedding? It would just be longer. Yeah, I really enjoyed our. I I, I enjoyed the venue. Um, it was really cool you know, for our five year wedding anniversary. You surprised me with a photo shoot at the venue, which I thought was really cool. And they've added some awesome stuff, like they've you know grown and everything. Um, so I loved the venue. I I loved. Uh, the food that we had, even though it wasn't, you know, the best circumstance, I enjoyed the food. I enjoyed the, the margaritas and, and all those different things. Um, I, we were in great company and, and a lot of people I care a lot about were there and I was appreciative of that. I just wish it was longer. Yeah, I can agree with that. I think that it's something where the next question I want to ask you is if we were to have our wedding like now at this point in our life, like let's say that we've just been engaged or dating this whole time, what would our wedding look like now? Because I think that when I think it, would I change anything about our wedding with the circumstances and with where we are, where we were in our life and all of that, I don't think that I would really change anything. Like nothing glaringly comes to mind of, oh, I hated that I did this or I hated this aspect of it. Uh, I think having a videographer is really the only thing that I would note within that of something that I kind of regret. But at the same time, I didn't 100% love how I looked on our wedding day. And so I feel like pictures and videos we've gotten more recently mean more to me in a sense sure. than the just the wedding day footage. But I do wish that I had some of that. Um, but I think that it was perfect for what we had. So if we were to be having our wedding right now, how do you feel like it would differ? I would hope that I'd have more of an appetite. That was the one thing that <laughs> killed me going into the wedding. I was so nervous. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that everything was perfect and everyone was taken care of and everything was just like seamless. And I, I do wish that I would have just like let everything go. But I also at that time from an, like an emotional intelligent perspective did not have near what I have now. And so I was just an anxious individual at that time and felt like I needed to control everything. I was mm -hmm. just like, I have, I'm just, you know, redlined, white knuckled, <laughs> clenching my jaw. I have to handle everything. Um, so I would have loved to be able to eat before the wedding. That would have been really nice. Um, the, the question was if I would change anything? If we were to have our wedding like right now, how do you feel like it would differ or would you still keep some of the I think key I would components? Have, I think it would have been smaller. Yeah. I think we would have had less people 100%. there. We didn't have a huge, uh, how many people did we invite? Like two I think or 300? We, no. Not even I that many? I think we invited 125 to 150 and I think just over 100 came. Mm. So I would say maybe less individuals, not because there was people there that I didn't inherently like, but it was a situation in which I didn't even get to talk to more than 50% of the people. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked to have some time with each person to express my appreciation, but also just to have some time with those people. Because there was people at our wedding that I hadn't seen in forever, and I didn't even get to spend a, a moment with them. I got to say, hi, love you, give you a hug. And then that was really it. Um, and so I would have preferred to have something a little bit more intimate. Yeah, I can agree. And I even at the time I had zero desire to have a destination wedding where like, and I know it'd be different renewing your vows versus a wedding, but especially looking at like our life now, it, it would be something that if we were getting married right now, I would be interested in a destination wedding just because it would be a small wedding, I yeah. feel like. And so it would just be like 15 people or 15, sure. 20 people. I don't know how many people specifically haven't made a list, but uh, I I would be way more open to that now. And it was not even, but it, like, that's the thing is our wedding was what I wanted it to be At exactly when it was. Exactly. So it's like, I can't be upset about that. I never have been upset about that, of course. Right. Me too. And a final question, what are your thoughts on the roughing the passer and everything <laughs> that's been going on in the NFL? What, what a change of pace here. Um, 
Keeping you on your toes. I, I think that the the NFL is is changing. They're trying to keep everyone safe. And I um it seems as though by trying to keep everyone safe, I don't know if it's a one for one correlation, but this is probably the most star players that the NFL has had out um at one time, especially star quarterbacks. Um but some of those are non non contact quarterbacks that are out. Are you just talking about Burrow? And Aaron. Aaron was definitely in contact when he oh, ruptured yes. his Achilles. Sorry. <laughs> I, you know, I had a moment of just thinking of when he was standing back, when he like got up and oh. he was standing and then he just like went back down. I, for some reason, just had that vision in my head, but you are correct. That was I contact. think that the burrow injury was contact, not in the game, but when it first happened and then they I'm very curious to see what happens with this whole investigation yeah. uh, within the Bengals and all that stuff. But um, with roughing the passer, you know, the NFL is trying to keep everybody safe. And I think that it's more about the offensive players protecting themselves and the quarterbacks protecting their receivers and those different things relative to the defensive player having this four by four square that they can hit the offensive players in, and if they don't hit them, then it's a flag. It's like you're you're taking away from the physicality of the game. It's a very physical game. These guys know what they're signing up for. Um, the helmet to helmet, you know, ripping guys' heads off. We can avoid those things, but you know, the tackling at the legs and all these different. Things, it's just the nature of the game. Yeah, I think that more needs to be taken into account for if someone is running full speed and is 250 pounds. If the quarterback just then releases the football right as they are getting to, or I've seen some, which I'm going to say, we're not roughing the passer and we're called that. It's like, how is that person supposed to slow down at all? It's not like they barreled them or anything. They, once they realize they took the least contact they could, but the other option is throwing themselves to the side and absolutely deteriorating themselves. Sure. And so the new rules of if they run and then they are acting like they're throwing a pass or something, that's too loose. And people can use those way too much to their advantage, I feel like. Yeah. So that's my thoughts. Yeah. If the NFL were to call me up and ask me, I'm I'd sure they will. Them. I'm sure they're really interested in my opinion. Yeah, I course. mean, I'm doing super well in fantasy football, so they probably have their eyes on me. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think I'm first or second in one league and then I'm in dead last in the other two. So yeah. really having a great year. Um, I think I'm going to probably write a book about how well I played. <laughs> Alex beat me by one point this past week. Yep. Really disappointing. A win's a win. A win is a win. But I will be very frustrated about the fact that I put, I still don't know how to pronounce his name. Okay. <laughs> I need to, any of the the husbands that are listening, wives, it doesn't matter. Your significant other, if you guys are in a fantasy football league, Sue, at after the 1 p.m. game start, she immediately is like, oh, I was going to play him. Oh, my I was, God. I no. was going to play him. You know, I I thought it, I was going to do it. Stop. I can't. And then no. the four o'clock games come. Oh, I was going to. He's on my bench. Pause. I was going to play Pause. him. There's a difference between getting frustrated that someone's on your bench versus literally about to make the decision to play them. Because if someone's on my bench and I had no thought to play them, it's just, all right, you got to take that L. But there's been times where you've pushed me the opposite direction of I've been like, oh, I really feel like this person's going to have a good game. Will Levis, for example, or I should pick him up. And you're like, Will Levis, drop him, pick up someone else. And it's no, like I was about thing. to put him in. And so there are times where literally right before the game, I'm like, I'm going to put this person in. And then I'm like, no, I don't know enough. I'm being emotional. I'm just going to put this person. Here's the thing is that she loves to call out the instances in which I make recommendations of the things that don't go well, she, but really makes, likes to take, really likes to take no, the, you um, help me a lot. She really likes to take the, what's on, what am I looking for? I, he wants to say, it's not the truth, that I like to take credit oh, yeah. when it's She his. likes to take the credit when I make adjustments to no, her, her you, roster. I and always, she's like, oh, he scored 30 points. I'm like, yeah, I told you to no, play them. Right after Shahid, what did I say? I said, thank you so much, honey, for making me pick him up. That was a great play. Exactly. And that's what I always say. I try to give you the thanks. But really, guys, let's talk about who knows the most about football. I absolutely fleeced him, traded Tank Dell for Devontae Adams. Oh, now you're now you're admitting that. <laughs> yeah. That's fascinating. Fascinating. You did not fleece me though. That's what you said. 
<laughs> I'll take it. Whatever. Peace Susu's got to go to an appointment. Um, you guys, ha- thank you so much for hanging out with us. Yes. Just a nice just little chilling. hangout session with Sue and I. Um, the glute program is now live. The 12 week glute growth program that we have worked so diligently on is now available. It will be in the show notes or the description below. Um, please grab that while it is on sale. It's 25% off right now. So mm-hmm. you'll never get it at this rate ever again <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it is an absolute steal. Uh, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you give us a thumbs up. We appreciate you guys so much and have an awesome day. Peace.